This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. My name is Peter Higgins. You can find me at Conquers3 on Twitter. And I'm here with my good colleague, Peter, at Weedy Dealer on Twitter. This is the Twin Peaks Podcast number 52. And it's the 30th of June and it's quarter to six in the evening in the UK. And of course, there's a few people still suffering from yesterday's fantastic win by the England football team when they beat Germany. I know I had a few beers and I think the whole street could hear me. Um, so uh, I'm not going to apologise for that. And I hope you guys and ladies also enjoyed the great win um, by the England football team yesterday. Pete, did you watch the game? Well, mate. Well, hello, everyone. Um, you, you, everyone, Everyone needs to thank me, you know, big time, because I worked out a correlation years ago that if i watch the match we always lose right so i've stopped watching it i can't be do i mean it's just not good for my heart and i've had so many times when i just build myself up and i get so excited about it and then and then it's a letdown so what i've decided is i'm not going to watch it until we get to the final but then i'm a bit worried now because i'm thinking if i just jinx the final <laughs> So, you know, there we go. Anyway, there so, we go. So we have to thank you for winning the game tomorrow. And then if yeah, we get to yeah, the final, you, we've got to yeah. try and coerce you not to watch the final. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you've got to make sure that I don't, you know, like cut my power cord or something so I can't watch it, you know? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> there you go. There you go, mate. You know, we're all going to have to, you know, have our little, do our magic magic ceremonies, you know, between now and the final. and just and, Oh, yeah. And hope. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Mate, mate, we, we've got to say um, commiserations and, and we feel for you to, the, to any German listeners and, and to any Scottish listeners who I know will also be very upset. And and well, and our Welsh listeners as well, Pete, who've, who've not yeah, been here thus far. I, I, th- I think it's, it's I think it's the nature of football, Pete. It's very, very unpredictable. And I, I, I dare say a lot of people are hoping that England win, and including myself, but it's very unpredictable, and that's and that's the lottery of a, of a knockout competition, and that's the way it should be. It, it builds that excitement. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Okie dokie, Pete. Well, let's let's get into this um, podcast. Yeah, mm. um, we, we've had some some great feedback. We've had um, lots of new subscribers across all the different platforms that we're on. So thank you ever so much for that. And welcome to all you new listeners. If you've not listened before, um, this is me, Peter Higgins, at Conquers3. I'm based in Leicestershire. Pete, at Wheelie Dealer on Twitter, is based in Windsor. We're not in the same room. Pete can't see me. I can't see him. This is unscripted. It's probably got... just as well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We've got... We haven't got face for TV, let's be honest. Let's, you know, we're not pretty boys. We're not like the, you know, the England football team boys all looking all, all, all well-groomed and got their hairs cropped. In fact, we've got no hair between us, I don't think, me and Pete, to be honest with you. But um, we're here just to share um, some of the insights and what we've seen across the markets. And also just to give you guys and ladies some sort of, um, you know conversational sort of insight into what we do and how we do it and what we le- what our learnings have been almost every 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 day is a school day for me and Pete so we try mm. and recap what we've learned um, over the past couple of weeks as well and also to tell you what what we've seen in the markets and sometimes some some of it's good and some of it's bad but all of it helps with our learning going forward and it's all to, all about trying to make each and every single one of us a better investor over the long term because Pete and I are not the sort of people that you're going to find on Twitter saying I know it all already I've got this don't worry I've got it and then you know two weeks four weeks a month down the line a year down the line we're here and our portfolio has been smashed to ribbons because we really didn't have a clue what we were doing you know you, you, you're so right I mean 
what is it? You've had nearly 30 years experience, I think, in the markets. And I've had well, well, probably 22, 23 years. So, you know, we've we've been around the block a bit. Yet both of us know that you you learn new things all the time. You just never stop that learning process. Absolutely. Um, Pete, we had a, an email from one of our listeners in Jersey. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I probably need to mention this because... He, he, he's one of those chaps, um, Lawrence, LR, and he's on Twitter. Um, and he, he's basically saying, you know, um, I'll, I'll read this as, as, and try and cut out a few bits of it. Um, what's, his, what's his Twitter handle, mate? Uh, Lee, at Leger. L-E-A-R-J-E-R. Sorry, I, I interrupted right at the key moment. What is it? There's nothing new about that, Pete, is there really? <laughs> That's how it goes. Yeah, Twitter handle at L E A R J E R. Oh, Learjet. Learger. No, it's J, it's a J E R, Pete, not T. Learjet, right? It's yeah. like a Learjet, but without the T. <laughs> yes. <an R>. yes. <laughs> oh my gosh! So we got an uh, an, e an email from him um, saying, you know, really enjoyed the the, the podcast, uh, but we needed to. Uh, I'll, re I'll read it anyway. Evening, Peter. First of all, I must tell you how much I enjoy the TPI podcast. I listen to them on walks near my home in Jersey or on my pedal bike into work. Other than the unscripted nature of the wide ranging content on market psychology and specific stocks, I do in particular enjoy listening to the dynamic between the two of you, especially when you're grappling with wheelie dealer on point. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to Twin Peaks 51 spurred me on to write to you, write you this note about certain comments and topics that have come up. Hope it's useful. Read Phil Oakley's appraisal of the AML IPO, specifically around the debt levels. You said he got so much grief for it at the time because no one wanted to hear it. I wasn't interested in that, in that IPO, so I can't profess to have followed any of this specifically at the time. But your comment got me thinking. The unfortunate consequence of providing an honest and candid assessment of any business in, in a public forum is that when laying bare the issues of or challenges that one perceives are likely to arose the, arise, arose the angst of those who have chosen to take account of you and whose interests are more likely to be damaged by such an assessment. They are the ones who will shout loudest to counteract a perceived negative fallout or talk their own book or, as you put it before, continue to peddle the narrative fallacy. And they will likely drown out the voices of those, in contrast, who have rationally evaluated the assessment, considered whether and what to what and to what degree they accept the author's point of view, but ultimately thank the author for their input in any event. The point being that, unfortunately, the original author is likely to receive remarks with a negative bias by virtue of vested interests. But importantly, each objection they receive, there will be a multitude of more disassociated or rational readers who will quietly, probably, privately thank that author for their considered point of view. I am sure that in reality is not lost on a seasoned journalist investor like Phil Oakley. Hopefully though, it's also clear to others who may wish to bravely pass good faith comment in public forum. Otherwise we stand to lose the benefit of another reasoned voice who has, va who has value to add to a collective knowledge. Yeah, Pete? I mean, that that is just so bang on, isn't it? I mean, you know, we we all know you can say whatever on a, on Twitter or or on a bulletin board or whatever, and you can get so much abuse for what you said. And yet, really, you're just putting a, a, a sensible side of a stock, a view of the stock, which actually, to people who are serious investors or serious traders, is useful to know. You know, it's good to hear what other people think about stocks, and this sort of knee-jerk shoot people down because they're not you know helping your ramp on your particular stock it's just it's just ridiculous it's childish it's pretty pathetic really i think it's i've always said i've had conversations with phil in the past about this and other people and you know we, we've all got different points of view and it's important you know we're you're selling a stock pete i'm buying it you know so someone's mm. buying even higher than i'm buying it yeah and someone's selling lower than you're selling. That's the whole point. That's what makes a market. And if you, if you're selling, you've got a different point of view to me. That and I'm buying it. And that's what enables the market to be the markets. And I think you shouldn't go. Um, I don't. It's a different form of passive microaggression. I think towards some, some people uh, by some people to try and intimidate others from having a voice. 
And I think having I've been able to have an opinion and give that opinion and be objective enables everybody to learn. And I think more people learn more from people that aren't actually as bullish about that stock. Yeah? Than the people that yeah. are bullish. Because you don't learn anything from all the bulls going woo, 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 woo. You know what I mean? It's about, actually, have you considered this? Actually, have you looked at that? Actually, did you see this coming down the pipe? Yeah? That's totally true. And, and you know, I think, I think um, I want to hear opposing views of my stock and stocks and what's, you know, what, what other pe people think on them or whatever. You know, as long as it's sensible. If it's just like silly trivia, I'm really not interested. Because it's, you know, it, it tends to, I find it tends to be the... The big significant things that drive stock prices. It's not some little piece of trivia in some little division a million miles away that no one, you know, where sales might have been hit because of some weird event that, that's absolutely nothing to a multi billion pound company or something. And yet some people get really obsessed about these little minutiae things and, and then they're like a dog with a bone on it, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I recall somebody having a, a really in-depth conversation with me a, a while ago, somebody I, I had a lot of respect for, and I still do. But they were asking me, um, had I considered the issue of a, of a particular company out of the time, a real a retail company, I think it was, um, about their debtor days. And the debtor days had gone up by, I think, three or four days in the past 12 months. And I was like, oh, my gosh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Is that going to sway you whether you buy the stock or not? But that was quite important to them and, and fair play. But it wasn't important to me, you know. Yeah, exactly. If it had gone up a hundred percent, then there'd be a problem because you know you, you you've got to get your money somehow and and pay for your you know pay for all your staff and pay for everything else that you're trying to do. So it is important. But you know, going from from five days, to, you know, 105 days to 208 days or 50 days to 53 days doesn't make doesn't mean anything to me. I don't really want to go into that much detail uh, regarding the stock. Um, the second aspect of this. Pete, I want to talk a bit more about. Yeah. So um, Lawrence Sting asks about doing your own research. He, he says the following. It's, it's such a common expression that we all hear, and the sentiment, of course, is totally right. But you were speaking about helping others to progress and learn to fish for themselves, so to speak. So I wondered whether you could share some ideas and tips, not specific stocks, but the selection process, i.e. how do you go about unearthing investments and your research methods? So that's what I want to talk about, and that's what I'm, I'm going to do. And Pete's going to try. Yeah. I'm going to, I've asked Pete to to share some of his methodology. I'm going to talk about. Um, I can't talk about it in all, in in its entirety because we, we want to keep this this um, this podcast quite short and sweet. So I'm going to I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of which I've got about thirty different aspects of how I select a stock. But I'm going to talk about one aspect of of how I get from A to B. Okay, Pete. So yeah, no. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start this process. The, for me, one of the first things I I look at is what's going. And I'll use the American example here now, and, and 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 do it full circle. I try and look at what the themes are and what's going on in the U.S. Yeah, what are the M and A's and takeovers that are going on? Which stocks are getting absolutely hit really really hard? Yeah, and are getting sold off. Yeah. And which stocks are actually doing really, really well, despite the macro, you know, the macro environment that's going on. So if I'm looking for a, for a, for a buy signal um, on a particular sector or a niche, I look at what's going on in the American market and I think, OK, what have we got in the UK that does aspects of or a similar nature in, in comparison to their US peer? And then yeah. I'll just put those stocks onto my watch list, which we're going to talk about later, and I start mm. whittling them down and going, which one of these is in the best shape? Which one of these is the most undervalued, but are in good shape? And then I start going into that stock. Okay, so I've got three or four of them stocks, and I'll quickly look at the the um, the niche that they're in, um, how much money they've got, so on and so forth. But I always, always, always start with, who's a CEO? Who's a CFO? Yeah, and if they get past the, the smell test, I carry on and start looking at all of the fundamentals regarding that particular company. Yeah, and I go through and I go through and I go through and I go through. There's lots of filters out there, and obviously you can you can go and purchase the the share scope, um, you know, software to help you filter all of that, and it's fantastic to compare A, B, C, D, E, F of that stock or stocks in that particular sector. So that yeah. cuts through 
the, the, the tens of hours that I end up doing on all this particular research. Brilliant. OK, so once you've got through that and you've done the fundamentals and you've checked how much debt they have, are they frequent flyers regarding doing a placing and raising money and dilution and dilution? Get rid of the get rid of those three or four stocks and you end up with one, maybe two that you're still going in. Then you carry on going even deeper into even deeper into what this stock is doing. What's the profitability? What they've done in the past 12 months? What are, what's going to and then I'm starting to look at what could be the catalyst for this stock to then push on from their 52 week lows. I'm a I'm a buyer of stuff nearer to their 52 week lows yeah. than I am a buyer of a stock at a 52 week high. Right. I'm doing my buying. And this is why I'm talking about stocks. I've, I've, I'm just disclosing now. I was buying back in March of last year, April of last year, June of last year, July of last year. I'm not doing that much buying this month, last month or the month before that. Yeah, I like to buy where the markets, uh, 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 but people are, people are just selling and selling and selling. That's when I'm attracted yeah. to the market. When there's a big sell off. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to buy then. Mm -hmm. uh, it's higher risk. And, I, and this is what I was talking about in the last podcast. It's higher risk doing it that way. Yeah. But that's where the bargains are. And what happens if you're lucky enough to pick one or two stocks which are undervalued and need a catalyst? When that catalyst ar arrives, it accelerates the appreciation of that stock. So nobody wants to buy it at a pound, but then they get a catalyst and it gets to one pound twenty, and then they get another catalyst gets to one pound forty, and then they actually come out with good results and reduce their debts, yeah. And then somebody somewhere decides, you know what? I actually quite like the look of this stock, and it's now me meeting my metrics and my buy signals and profitability, and they're quite happy to buy it at one pound sixty, one pound eighty. So you're already before the herd arrives up. 60, 70, 80%. And then lo and behold, as what's happened to 45 of my um, stocks in the past, the private equity or the peers or their rivals overseas or somewhere else in the sector decide, you know what, we'd like to buy that stock and we're quite happy to pay £2.20, £2.40. As what happened with um, Arrow Global and also what happened with um, Horizon Discovery. P, yeah. um, doubled, um, nearly trebled in, in price from, from where I purchased it. And that's that's part of the process. I'm trying to keep it as short and sweet as possible here because I yeah, can talk yeah, about yeah. Oh, another, another time. But one of the other things that I do um, with regards to finding stocks is that we have on Twitter people in the US and the UK that will poo-poo and absolutely rip apart X amount of stocks, right? That, that those people are actually quite good for use on Twitter because it alerts you to stocks that everyone hates right? yeah. and do not want or will, you know, they're all going, ah, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. What, how, how, what possessed you to buy that stock? Yeah. And that's when I'm alerted to that stock and I'll go, okay, let me have a look at that. No one yeah. likes it. Okay. So now it's 50% below its, its uh, intrinsic value and everyone's writing it off saying it's going to go to zero. That's now on my watch list and I will carry on looking at that stock and researching that stock until it gets to a point where it bases or it starts to improve. And that's when I'm going to buy. And it's still off everyone's radar because everyone's already written it off and said it's going to it's dead. Yeah. 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 And yeah, I'll talk about a stock um, regarding that. And, you know, we'll talk about um, Morrison's and what's happened with Morrison's. That's a prime example of a stock that everyone thinks is boring and going nowhere. And now it's in the middle of a takeover bid and it's going to be my... If I sold it now, it'd be my 40, 46th takeover, Pete. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, that's lovely. So how do you do yours, Pete? How do you start with um, doing your research process? Well, but before we touch it, can I just like put a couple of bits into what you just said? Um, one thing you said towards the end was that you, you look for the price to be, to be you know, nice and low or whatever, but you're also looking for it to have based... And, and sort of formed a floor. And do you then look for when it starts breaking out and moving higher? I, I do. I mean, I should have said that. Sorry. I, I, with regards would to you, with regards would you to the buy stock, before the break? I'm using fundamentals to get to do. Does this stock meet my criteria? Right. Yeah. Then you're talking about um, watch list later on. I put it on my watch list. Right. And I've got a dream sheet price i call this my x forces days i i, I yeah. would like to buy at this price right and i don't care if the share price is at two pounds at the time or near the base of where i want it 
if I finish my research, I'm not going to immediately buy it because I'm waiting for a catalyst. So I've got a price that I'm happy to buy it at. And most of the time, it's lower than when I finish my my um, research on the stock. So if it's yeah. a pound, ultimately, I'd like to buy it at, at 80 pence, right? But if yeah. the catalyst starts and the positivity starts, I'll be forced sometimes to buy it at pound twenty. Yeah, but I'll only buy it at one pound twenty if the sum of the parts um, is nearer to one eighty or to over two quid or whatever. And I'm happy to have done the research as well, Pete, and find that actually the share price has gotten way away from me because I've taken my eye off the ball, and that happens a lot. You're like, oh, I put this yeah. on my watch list, and I'm happy to buy it if it's at one pound twenty or one pound forty. And then lo and behold, you get distracted or something's happened in life. And the share price gets to one pound forty, goes above, and you go, "Ah, oh, I'm, I'm not happy to buy it now. It's a, it's a bit higher than I wanted to buy it." And whoosh, before you know it, at a blink of an eye, it's at two quid. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It happens, Pete. Yeah, I mean, I I always have this thing where, with me, if I want a stock, I want the stock, and quite often, I'd rather be on the train and pay a little bit more for it in the short term than to not be on that train when when I'm pretty sure in one, two, three years, it's going to be a lot higher because I look very much the long term. Um, it, so, so yeah, so that's that's good. About, so you, you wait for it to form a base or whatever. Would you buy before the breakout has actually happened? I don't I don't I mean, I use technicals, Pete, but I'm not necessarily bothered about breakouts. OK, um, what I'm actually looking for is because you and I have spoken about this before. I'm looking for higher highs. So daily higher yeah. highs, Pete. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not looking for a breakout. I'm looking for the stock price to base. I'm not looking for the share price to go lower and then lower and then lower and then lower. And then for me yeah. to go, right, okay, it's hit my price. I'm looking to buy it. I've got a price range that I want to buy it in. And yeah. once I've seen the price stop falling over a period of time, I'm looking yeah. for the share price to go from 101 to 104 to 107 to 108. And then yeah. I'm looking for it to stay above that and not fall back to 99p again and just stay around that sort of level for a little while and then carry on going higher. And then I think, OK, I'm hoping and praying now that, that the price is in. Or there's been some news that no one else has, has taken any notice of. There might be a case of a fund manager has incrementally just, you know, an RNS has come out and they've raised their, their stake by half a percent and gone over 5% now to 5.5. Yeah. yeah? Uh, or, or whatever, whatever. Yeah, or the another as we've seen before with like Future Group, uh, Future PLC that made an absolute fortune for me, Pete. It, yeah. it decides, you know what? We're fed up with this particular CEO. We're going to bring in somebody who's going to absolutely fundamentally change the business, and it's a recovery specialist or a transition specialist. Then they create their own catalyst by saying, "Let's shake this company up." And we've seen that in a stock oh. which I had on my radar, Aviva. Right, the CEO has come in there and completely shaken up that company, and the share price has rocketed, and it, and it could go higher from where it's where it's where it's been. So that's the sort of thing I'm looking for. A catalyst. A catalyst could just simply be a change of CEO, a change of CFO. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. And and I must say, you know, one of my favourite plays is the recovery play thing. But what what I'd often do is, if I've got to a position where I really really want that stock. What I would often do is just buy a starter position, buy, say, 1% of my portfolio, you know, once I pretty much think it's settled down. Um, and then if it breaks higher, I'll then buy, you know, another percent or another percent or another, whatever whatever I, you know, want to go up to. Yeah. Um, something else you mentioned, which was, in, you said, um, you said, you know, when the price has dropped and it's high risk, do you know, it's a bit of a perverse thing about that because I think... Um, in reality, the lower a price goes, the lower a risk is. The higher a price is, the higher a risk is. From from a sort of like theoretical, you know, um, portfolio management, you know, academic study kind of viewpoint, yeah. But I think the thing is, even though it's really low, and in theory your your risk is actually much lower when you're buying it low. The problem, psychologically, it's so difficult to do. When you're in the eye of the storm and you've got, you know, COVID-19 coming around everywhere and the whole world's shutting down, we've got no idea what's going to happen. You need, you know, if you're male, you need balls of steel. You know, if, if, if you're female, I don't know what you need yeah. made of steel, you, you, but you, you need you, something you, made you, of steel. You're, you're right, but you've got to caveat that with 
What are the reasons why that price has now got stretched and created more risk because the share price has gone higher? And then you've got, like, as you say, the perverse other aspects of the risk. It's it's getting sold off. Take COVID out of the situation. The, the stock's getting sold off and sold down for a reason. Share prices go lie because there's less buyers and more sellers, right? But there's yeah, usually yeah. a reason why. As, as the growth rate slowed down, as a new competitor come into that niche and they're now eating their lunch, you know, we've seen that with all the retailers. Everyone's saying, oh, what, well, you know, Marks and Sparks have had that share for 20 odd years. Mm. It's, it's, it's down 75% in the last 15, 20 years. Why? Because it took so long to go online. You know, we've lost Debenhams, we've lost Woolies. They just, just, they just got too stayed, Pete. They didn't go with what the te technical innovations were. They didn't become omni-channels to allow people to buy wherever they wanted to buy. Click and save, click, mm. click, <laughs> click and save. Yeah. Click, yeah. You know, click and come and um, click and buy sort of thing. So yeah. all those sort of things, you've got to innovate. Companies cannot sit on the laurels, and they now they're now learning that the very very hard way. You know, and we had technology and now we've had COVID and the ones that haven't stepped up to the plate are still struggling, Pete. But the bit I wanted to add in there, Pete, yeah, is that yeah. the past I stumbled upon um, Benjamin Graham, David L. Dodd's book. And I've been putting this in most tweets going um, for the last four years. I've been putting them in tweets and the book is called Security Analysis. And it's by Benjamin Graham, David L. Dodd. And I've been yeah. using that book for the past 20 years. It's now in its sixth edition, Pete. And there's a really, really good um, page within the book, and it's called um, Relationship of Intrinsic Value Factors to the Marketplace. And it takes in all the general market factors and individual factors. So you go from, from the left-hand side of the book, speculative to be, to be um, investment, market factors, future values, intrinsic value factors, Technical, manipulative, psychological, management and reputation, competitive conditions and prospects, possible and probable changes in volume, price and costs, earnings, dividends, ca assets, capital structure, terms of issue, aptitude of public towards the issue, bids and offer a marketplace. And that's like a funnel that I've been using for the past 20 years and I've been refining for the past 20 years. And the cost of me going through this over the past 20 years has got to be about a quarter of a million quid that it's yeah. cost me to learn this particular thing. Yeah. And I still haven't got it perfected. And I still haven't got it right. But that's what's led me to be always looking for that net net margin sort of safety aspect where I'm trying to buy one pound of assets for less than a pound. And if I can yeah. buy it for yeah. 40 pence or 30 pence, happy days. Because it gives me that safety net of thinking, even if I was to break, if this company was to fall apart like a like a Lego brick castle, all those sum of parts and all those different individual bricks of that company would value, be valued at a pound. So even in a fire sale, hopefully, I would get the 30 pence I've invested and won't lose any money. So even yeah. if the share price went to 15 pence, yeah, if somebody came in and went, whoosh, okay, we're going to buy this in a fire sale, they'd have to pay 30 pence or near enough 30 pence. And my hope is... I'm buying the ones that are better with less debt, hopefully most of the time, but all the time, that can recover, get a catalyst, get above where I bought it at, become more attractive to predators, yeah, Pete, which is often the case, yeah? yeah, and then they get taken over, not only at the sum of parts value that I've assessed it at, but sometimes above that. And the recent ones, for instance, that didn't do that is like Talk Talk. I had a sum of parts of one pound thirty, one pound forty, and that takeover has been going on for nearly a year and a half now. I've sold it out, sold it, and got rid of it, and the, and the takeover still going on. But it's, it's not going yeah. to be taken over at the price I thought it was going to be, you know. But that's me. I've been learning that thing and learning, and I still haven't got it right, and I'm still learning that, it. That book is really old, isn't it? Is it's it like an old, old book, Pete. It's like 1960 or something, isn't it? Or... It's, it's in its sixth edition, Pete, and it's been around for a long time. But yeah, I, the, the beauty of learning and the beauty of a good book is that the actual fundamentals of it will not alter. Yeah. The intrinsic yeah. value of an intrinsic value of an intrinsic value remains the same. So there's a chart that I put up, Pete, and you've got the share price on the left-hand side going up, right? And you've got essentially the, um, the time frame going across underneath on the right. It's like a typical graph. And you've got the red line going through it in the middle of the chart. Yeah, yeah. the intrinsic value is going up over time, right? 
the market price, what you and I are happy to pay for it for, depending on what's going on in the macro environment and what's happening in the FTSE or happening on AIM, will always fluctuate. That's why prices are going up, up every single day, right? It's wiggling all over the place. Wiggling all over the place. Yeah. But you know what doesn't change, Pete? Yeah, that much is the intrinsic value. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I and I'll talk a bit more about Morrison's um, later on. Yeah. No, that mate, that that's that's really really interesting and really useful. I mean, I've read The Intelligent Investor a few times by Benjamin Graham, and that's that's a great read. Brilliant book. And, uh, I can imagine the you know the one with Dodd as well is is uh, well I know it's supposed to be a very good book. So uh, yeah, it sounds like a, a good read. This is a quick hello to you, our valued Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener. Whatever channel you're listening to, please make sure to subscribe and you'll always be the first to get the new episodes. Thank you for your continued support. Um, yeah, well, I was going to talk about, about my sort of uh, approach. If, well, mate, before we do that, your watch list, yeah? Yeah. You mentioned your watch list. So, so your watch list, so you... You've sort of said that you're looking at, you might start off looking at four companies or something and you sort of drill it down. Is, is your watch list that small? No. My watch list at the moment has got about 25 stocks in it. And, and, right? and what, so, what, so what I, what I do, Pete, I drill it down. I start, I look at the, I look most of the time at, at what are the peers. I've, I've, I've looked in the US and I've got these companies in the UK and I just drill it down and I'll just get to the point where I've got maybe two stocks in that sector and I'll put them on my watch list, right? Yeah. And then what I'll do is that I'll watch and watch and watch, but all the time I'm researching these two stocks, and eventually they'll you know, a bit like Islander, there'll only be one, right? Yeah. <laughs> of, of that particular um, search that I did, and that one stock will sit in my watch list, right? And for a variety of different reasons, there's currently around 25 in my watch list. And what I then do is that when I've sold a stock or exited a stock, I'm looking to compound whatever I returned from that sold stock into the next one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So whether I'm buying it in in in, a, in two tranches or one tranche, I'll just go, right, okay, I'm, I'm reinvesting now into this stock. And that's what I do. Yeah. So my watch list has got about 25 in there at the moment. Some of them closer to being purchased than others. And some of them may never get purchased, to be fair. Yeah. So your you so where is your watch list? What form does it take? Is it like on on is it a website watch list somewhere? How how do you do it? I have my platform Pete and it sits in there all written out. Um I I I still haven't added it up to my ShareScope platform but that 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 should be where I, I put it because I can get alerts on like... on that. But I do have a spreadsheet that it sits on Pete, yeah. Okay, right. So that yeah, okay. So that's cool. So um yeah, that's interesting because I I uh, used to use a watch list, you know, many years ago, because everybody uses a watch list. So it was like you've got to have a watch list. You know, every all of the software and everything that you, every website you go to, you know, has a watch list function. So you've got to have a watch list. And I used to sort of do that, and then I sort of realised I never really used it, <laughs> and it was a bit of a waste of time for me. What what I tend to do these days, and I maybe this has changed, I don't know. I think perhaps it has. But um, because I tend to be someone who doesn't really sell their stocks very often, yeah? If I'm selling, you know, more often than not, it's because I'm top slicing something. So, for instance, um, what did I sell the other day? Yeah, KCT, you know, Ken and Carter. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd done really well on it at run up and it had had a really good run up and I was looking at the forward PEs and stuff and it was starting to look, you know, not that cheap anymore. It was like on a forward PE of, I don't know, 36, 38 or something. I thought, God, this is getting a bit meaty. But not only that, the size of my position in my portfolio, you know, something like that, KCT, especially after a good run up. I'd probably be happy to have about 4% of my portfolio in it. But it had grown to certainly 5%. It might even have been 6 So I sliced 1% off. And I'm sure, you know, in the fullness of time, I'll be slicing more off. And it comes back to what I said earlier about this idea that the higher a price goes, the more your risk is. Because what you're doing is you're introducing valuation risk. And it's like companies can get away with high PE multiples 
when they're that sort of go-go stock and, and they're growing fast and whatever. But the thing is, fast growth rarely keeps going for a long time. You know, maybe what, you know, five, six years, maybe you could you could keep a pretty fast clip of, of growth going. You know, companies like Amazon have done amazing things on growth, but they're the exception. They're really unusual. And, and like most sort of small companies and that, they can do fast growth for a while, and then it sort of peters out and they end up doing a profit warning because their expectations have just got too excited. You know, everyone's got ahead of themselves. No, so, you know, you, you, you're spot on there, Pete, and I, I would agree. A lot of the tech stocks, especially the, the US ones, they, they get such a premium. People are trying to short them. I remember some very noteworthy individuals in the US and the UK um, shorting Tesla at, at four, $400 a share, 500 a share, 600 a share. And where did it peak out? 800 you know, uh, probably more than that. Yeah. Um, those yeah. shorters got Able. absolutely creamed. Um, and this is the thing you mentioned in the last podcast, you know, you'd be very careful when, you when you're trying to short a, short a market, you know, don't short a quiet market. But I think also don't, don't, don't try and short a stock that's got momentum and a lot of people putting valuations in it. And it actually, they're innovators. Innovators can innovate and continue to innovate. It's the boring mundane stocks that are highly cyclical yeah, that have got a massive cost base or a fixed cost base, and then the profitability starts to to uh, reduce. Yeah, those are the ones you need to be looking out to short because they get overpriced because every man and his dog wants to be in them because they're going up. You yeah. know, and then when they have a little bit of a blip, they're running for the hills because they've got no conviction in the stock and they sell out. You know, those are the ones that you want to you want to look to short. Um, but yeah, it's 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 really really Im important, Pete, um, to assess the risk regarding the value and you doing your top slicing is, is, is what you need to do and consider to lower your risk but also about the fact not giving up masses of your profit because when that profit warning yeah. comes or that yeah. stock slows down or it just says oh you know what we were expecting you know nine but we got six wallop all, the, all of a sudden the PE ratio gets gets shortened and the stock gets shortened by 30 40 50 percent with it so all the profitability is gone yeah, Which you, is what you mentioned with with the Clinton the other day as well, Pete. That that happened with you. So the thing yeah. that you did with you know with this other stock is exactly the thing to do with um, Kin and Carter. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've got a similar situation with PayPal, P Y P L, and that's a bit of a weird one for me because I don't do that many overseas stocks. I, I sort of sometimes just like to have one out of so I don't know out, out of novelty. I think. Um, so I might have one or two, but what I tend to do is, like with PayPal, to avoid the currency risk, I do it as a long spread bet, and I've had it for years, and I've just let it run, and it's been absolutely brilliant. And of course, it's leveraged, so it's like been amazing. But the thing is, the exposure of that position now, and bear in mind it's leveraged, so it's even more risky. The exposure of that position has probably got up to sort of six percent of my portfolio. And that's not ridiculous by any means for, for a company like PayPal. But because it's leverage, I'm just thinking, mm, you know, we're at that time of year, the markets are quiet. Chances are we could have a bit of a wobble for the autumn because we often do. And I'm thinking maybe I should just slice a little bit off it. So I probably will. So, you know, I, I can't remember what I am. But let's say, for instance, I was let's say I was 10 pounds a point or something. I might just dial it down to eight and just just reduce the risk a little bit. Bearing in mind it's leveraged as well, so you you know you really don't want to get too carried away with leverage. Let me, um, let me ask you this, Pete. And, and yeah. I'm asking this because as as a person listening to you and you know, almost like a listener to the podcast, this yeah, is well, what okay. I would be asking. I'd be asking, mm, why would Pete run a spread bet on PayPal rather than buying PayPal and holding the stock for one year, two years, or three years? Why would you not have bought two grand's worth or 10 grand or 20 grand's worth of that stock instead of doing a leverage bet on it? What's the, the cost? Because you you're pay, you paying to hold that spread bet all that time, aren't you? Yeah, but it's actually really cheap. I mean, the the cost, the interest charge, as we discussed on t TPI 47 and 48, I think, yeah. where we talked about spread betting, um, the interest charge for holding for a year is about 3.5%, so it's incredibly cheap. And the gains I've had from PayPal it's probably done way more than 10% a year. Um, so it's more than, than, than made up for that cost. But 
the beauty is first I only need to put a little bit of money down. So instead of putting, say, 10 grand down, I've only got to put, you know, 2000 quid down. So so that leverage is is very helpful and very nice. Um, the other the, the real reason I do it is that I don't have a US dollar account. I don't want a US dollar account. I don't want to get in the habit or in the game of forex trading. I'm just not interested. I was talking to a mate the other day on on DMs on Twitter. Yeah, and he'd said to me, done really well on some American stocks, but then he'd taken a 20% hit because of the currency movement. So, you know, and I just don't want to be doing with that. And the, the great thing with spread bets is that, like I say, I don't need to worry about having a dollar account or a euro account, whatever. I can just do it. Do it on, I mean, I nearly did. I mean, such, I'm so kicking myself. Um, on a podcast ages ago, I mentioned Volkswagen saying I thought that looked a really good buy. And of course, needless to say, I didn't do anything about it. And it's absolutely I, I, shot. Pete, I but, think that was when we were talking to Tim Rogers, you said that. Oh, it was ages ago I said it. I think it was even before that. Oh, OK, OK. Uh, but anyway, the point was, you know, I could have done a long spread bet on that, even though it's in euros, you know, whatever. So, so um, yeah, so that's, that's really why I did it, do it that way. Um, back on to what we were saying. So, so really, I'm someone who just sort of tends to what I'm looking for. And I've gone more this way over the years. What I'm looking for are what I think are really great companies that can be really enduring. So it's like in five years time, 10 years time, even if I'm still holding it, it will be way, 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 way higher than it is today. That's the kind of companies I'm looking for. And as a result, I've become like mega, mega picky. You know, I've just got so much more um, careful about what I buy. And I mean, for instance, I bought the other day, about a week ago, or whatever, I bought Sophie on SPE. And what happened with that one is I've been watching that for years. I've probably been watching it for three years or more. And I could see that it was winning more contracts. It was doing more stuff with its software. And I could just see that improvement, you know, over time, improving, improving, improving. And I'm looking at it now and thinking, well, actually, it's not a bad price now. I think it's, 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 it's a good time to do it. And um, so I've taken a starter position. And the great thing with a starter position, so I bought just like 1%. Um, if it starts moving higher on some good news, I've got the option of buying more, yeah? But equally, if it has bad news and it doesn't do much and it goes down, well, I've only got a small, small proportionately, relatively in my portfolio, I've only got a small amount of it. So if it does fall, it doesn't really make that much difference at portfolio level. So I'm quite happy to let it ride out for a bit, unless there's something catastrophic, like you know, there's accounting irregularities or something, in which case I'm probably better off just dumping it. Um, but you know, if there's if it's a sort of temporary kind of problems that it will get through, I'm well happy to ride it. I can always add to it another point in the future. That makes perfect sense, mate. And that goes back to the conversation we've been having about position sizing, doesn't it? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, so in terms of, I mean, like I said, I don't really have a watch list anymore. And in terms of my process, I've talked about this before on a podcast where I have this, instead of like you, where you sort of drill down onto certain stocks and then do loads of research on them. My research is like a kind of longitudinal research. It's like, it's like in a way I've been researching SPE, um, you know, Sophie on for, for three years or more. And, and it's like, Every time it puts out a results statement, I'm reading that results statement, I'm thinking about it, thinking, right, is, you know, is this company progressing? What's going on? Da, da, da. And you just gradually build up over time in your brain a really good picture of what that company's like. And, um, and then obviously you do more bits of research and stuff once you get down to the, down to the nail. Um, but that's, that's really how I tend to do it these days. So it's like, um, on my website on www.wheeliedealer2.weebly.com, I've got a page called The Little Black Book. And, and I've actually got a little black book. It's like a little black notebook. And what I do is 
when I find an interest in companies, it could have been an RNS I read in the morning, or it could be something I've seen in Investors Chronicles, something I've seen in Shares Magazine, something, just something I've come across somehow, because you're always coming across companies. Um, I just make a note of it in my book. And if it's one I really like, I put like a star on it sort of thing. And quite often, that you know, I'll be interested in that stock at that point in time. It's like, yeah, I'm quite fascinated by that stock. I quite like that stock. But someone else will come along, and that will take my interest. But it's almost like because I don't very often sell anything, it's very rare I've got a free slot or I've got free cash. So it's only once I'm in a position where I've either got free cash or I can see a way that I'll soon have free cash. So, for instance, with KCT, right, with Kin and Carter, I could see the position was going up and going up and going up. So every day I'm looking at it for weeks and thinking, well, I'm going to be top slicing this soon. And I'm thinking, right, if I top slice it, what am I going to put that 1% into? And then I start getting more serious, you know, looking through my black book and stuff and reminding myself, of ones I've taken a notice of before and like, oh yeah, I really like that or whatever. And just sort of re and sort of drilling down on a stock I particularly want. And then, you know, I'll make my move once I'm in, once I'm ready and able to do that, you know? No, that, that makes perfect sense, Pete. And I think this is the beauty of what we said before. Everyone needs to find their own strategy. Everyone needs to do their own research, but they've got to find their own methodology that they're comfortable with. And that takes years to refine and years to get to the point where we're comfortable and we can never copy someone else's strategy and be comfortable with it. We've got to find our own because we've all got different risk profiles and different things that we're comfortable with. You know, some people are looking for breakouts, some people are looking for, for stocks that everyone's talking about. Some people are looking for, for stocks that are have been written about in a particular magazine or, or from a particular blog or a particular article or whatever. If, you, if, if that's what you're comfortable with, that's what you need to do. But I'm comfortable with what I do, and I do get a lot of grief about, you know, the amount of research that I do. Yeah. My my results are are my results, you know, good. Your results are amazing. Or, or so different. Second yeah. page, sorry. Your results are amazing. So it's 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 um it's absolutely a system that works very well for you. I mean, the thing that 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 I very much take into consideration is, you know, it, we've talked about this a lot. It's about activity levels. For me personally, I can't be doing with it. You know. I don't have the time. It's like my, my health sucks sucks up enough of my time as it is. I don't want to be, you know, I want to be down the pub enjoying myself. I don't want to be a slave to my stocks. My my stocks, my portfolio need to be working for me. I don't need to be working for it, if you see what I mean. I, I completely agree with you there, mate. Completely. You know, and I've got even more that way as I've got older. And that's one of the reasons I started doing an income portfolio as a sort of experiment on the side, really. Yeah was because, you know, I sort of felt that as I get older and I get less able to do some of this stuff because, you know, the old, the old brain will be shot to pieces, you know how it is. Um, you know, I, I probably want an even more passive portfolio and I'm very happy to accept the lower returns that go with that as long as the returns are good enough, you know. So, so instead of trying to shoot the lights out and make 100% a year on my portfolio, with my normal portfolio, I'm really happy if I'm making 10% a year. I mean, as it happens, I'm probably making more than that. But but that's not the point. It's like I'm I'm perfectly happy if I just make 10% a year. That, that's fine, you know. As, as long as I can eat and drink and do what I want to do, then brilliant. No, I, I think that's the whole point, Pete. Um, I, I, obviously, people are probably fed up with me talking about um, mindfulness and, and psychology. But the, the essence for me is about quality of life I have um, with my my friends and my family and just you know the week before last being able to go and see my my family up in in Oldham and spend time with them was yeah. so blessed there was no amount of money that you could have put up put on that you know it was completely priceless moments which I've not been able to have for over 18 months Pete you know that, and, yeah, that's and, exactly the point and, it's like... and, and, and that's what it's about you know the, yeah. the, the other week um, sorry last week Tuesday you know, I had Phil Oakley come up from, you know, his neck of the woods, you know, a couple hundred miles to come and see yeah, me. Yeah, we saw the pictures of the beers. Thank you very much. <laughs> to uh -huh. come and see me and have a chat. And that was just brilliant. He's got time now to do what he wants to do. And he's like, oh, I'll pop up and see. I'm like, what? And, and he did. So it's brilliant. But Pete, it's about taking the time out to spend the time you want to spend with people. It's about spending 
the time to do the things you want to do. You know, yeah, and that's what absolutely. life is really about. It's not about a, this stock, that stock, up and yeah. down, did it, and screen watching, as we've spoken about before. You know, spending well, like, four hours on watching a screen is not life, people. You know, well, it's like when you when you get to the pearly gates and you stood there and Saint Peter's got his clipboard out, he doesn't <laughs> say he doesn't say right. What was your portfolio worth when you when you when you popped your clogs? He doesn't say what was your CAGR return per year, and it's like, well, if it ain't good enough, you ain't coming in. You're down absolutely, to absolutely don't Pete. work like that, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. For me, it's 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 about what have you done to impact and help other people in your community? What have you done to help the people around you? What have you done for the people that are, are really finding it and really really struggle? I know. I know doctors and psychologists, Pete, that have struggled to, through this lockdown. So what about the people that had, you know, mental health and other issues going on before that? You know, that's been my focus, mate, for the past 18 months and will continue to be until we get out of this lockdown. You know, I'm hoping that they got people up and down the country got a lift from the football. But some people don't watch bloody football and have got no interest in football. Mate, you know? it, would have, it would have put me down, so it was a good job I didn't watch it. Yeah? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Uh, but you know what I mean? It's about what's important. What more can we each do to help everybody else? It's not about the size of your portfolio, folks. It's not about the, the you know, the, the, the brake horsepower on your car. You know, our expensive. Oh, yes, car. it is. It's yes, about it is. what can you do to help others? That's what life should be about. You know, your family and others. What can you do to help them? How can you make things better for them? Totally. You know, and I think the more that we other people realise that, the more that does spend less time on twitter giving other people a hard time because a lot of people are going through some stuff that people do not realize they're going through yeah you know, and that is more health and mental health and all the rest of it if you don't know what's going on with other people temper what you're saying before you start lashing out yeah that 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 is more common than a lot of people realize i think i mean i talk to talk to a lot of people and that that i know through doing wheelie dealer and stuff and it's been been fantastic that i met so many great people and, you know, talking to people, you really start to realize that people have been through some pretty tough times. And, you know, it's it's we've we got to be grateful if we've come through it. All right. You know, I, I, I completely agree with you. Pete. I completely agree. Do you want to do the thank yous or whatever? What, what are we move? Yeah, on got, next, mate? yeah, I think on that note, um, I just want to once again, um, you know, we've we've got some wonderful, wonderful people in our um, Twitter sphere and who listen to this podcast. Uh, and they've 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 really done the job again. Um, the the Twin Peaks podcast, as you all know, and if you're new listeners, we're supporting a charity, uh, a charity that's quite um, near and dear to me, and it's called the um, the Memphis Charity. It supports disabled um, children and their carers and families in the community in the round Leicestershire, and we're raising money for that charity. We had an initial soft target of of £2,500 because that's the average number of listeners that we, Pete and I have been getting for the podcast um, of late. Uh, and we thought, you know what, if people can donate a pound each or two pounds, you know, the point is a pound, donate a pound. Do it anonymously, you know, if you can't yeah. afford it. You know, do it anonymously, just, just donate a pound. Takes us two and a half K. Um, so far, uh, we're sitting at um, 3800 and 58 just shy of eight three thousand eight hundred fifty nine. so we've done absolutely brilliantly um so our new target is now 2500 um sorry five let's start again our new target is five thousand pounds um yeah. at the moment excluding some people that have um donated more than once and excluding myself and pete we've probably had 88 or 89 listeners that have donated but they've donated Thank they've you. donated handsomely and the shout outs this week go to um, Scrumpy Triple Two, who's donated again. Um, number 51, another great and inform informative, cheery podcast. Kevin Taylor, best of luck with the, with the fundraise and thanks for the good work on this podcast. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin donated £100. Excellent. Um, David Batchelor, didn't leave a comment, but donated £50 plus gift aid. And then we had Bruce Packard, who we didn't know that listened to our podcast at all. Um, he donated um, twenty pounds. Uh, comment was good work, chaps. I enjoy the podcast. Bruce writes for um, for ShareScope, and he's a well regarded, highly respected writer out there in the investment community. So I want you to thank 
you four for uh, for making donations since that um, last podcast, and we're hoping that you you get ladies and gents will also join in and be part of this particular fundraising community that we're doing um, in the sense of paying it forward for those that are um, are less able and less you know getting less care than they normally would. And also we're heading into the summer, folks. So it's about the fact that you know a lot of the opportunities in schooling that some of these young individuals would normally get would ordinarily shut down during the summer. So it's about, you know, considering that as well. And hopefully some of the monies we raise can help them um, do some things and activities with some of these um, young people as well um, during the summer period when we're, a lot of us are going to be trying to take holidays and spend time in the pub, in the sunshine and doing other things. They probably won't be able to do some of that. So if we can and you can donate a pound or more, please, please, please consider doing so. You can find the gift, the, the Just Giving page at justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash Twin Pete's challenge. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, people. Um, mate, I've got a couple of quick things I wanted to throw in very fast. Um, one of them was brilliant idea. That I, I, was, I mean, I mean it's, it's crazy how time flies. But I was in the pub with you and Hughes some time ago now. I mean, God, it's, it's crazy. Um, and he mentioned to me that he uses... Google Alerts. Now, I've never even heard of the thing before. So there's this thing called Google Alerts, which presumably you go on to Google and it, you, you find it there. And what he does is you can put in like search things. So say you've got a company that, that you, um, you're interested in or you hold or whatever. You can type, you know, the company name into that, uh, into your Google search, in, into this alert thing. Yeah. And it will tell you when certain news events happen. So you have to try it. I'm just telling you that. I mean, sorry, Ewan, if I've got that completely wrong, but that's that's sort of the the, the gist of it. And thank you for giving me that great idea. Pete, doesn't um, Ewan doesn't Ewan subscribe to ShareScope then or SharePad? I don't know. I don't know. But he's say because not, that's exactly the function that they could you could probably do on that. You know what I mean? Yeah, you can do that kind of thing kind of thing on SharePad. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, he's he's at Ewan Hughes Seven on Twitter. Whether you are an experienced or new investor, you know how valuable it is to conduct portfolio enhancing analysis and to have easy access to data that will give you the edge. As a Twin Peaks investing podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only and you can subscribe using the promo code Twin Peaks. The incredible and exclusive offer means that monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peaks promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention quick is a few people have, have queried with me about how investment trusts are charged. Yeah. And I think the reason this has come about is because they've um, bought shares in, a, in an investment trust. So say they bought like a polar capital trust or something like that pct um on there what happens so, so, so remember it's different to a unit trust a unit trust is, is like another beast entirely an investment trust is is really like a company yeah? like a company that does investing on your behalf sort of thing you buy you buy shares in the company um anyway on there it says what what you'll find when you buy it whatever it will say um, ongoing charges. So a lot of people have said to me, well, what's this about ongoing charges? How does that get charged? And all it is, those ongoing charges are sort of taken from the value of the fund that the company is actually running. So you never see those charges. They're already, so, so really it's sort of in the performance of, of the um, investment trust, really. So you don't ever see it. It's already in the NAV. It's, it was like taken out of the net asset value. Um, and that's basically how it works. So, so basically, you, if you see these ongoing charges, they're not something you pay extra. They're already sort of incorporated in the way things are done. So just don't worry about them. 
Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah it makes sense. I mean, for, for me, I've always seen the ongoing charges as the the recurring costs of running the fund. Yeah. 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 And those are the costs that are then, you know, imparted on you. And that's what's the drag is regarding the uh, performance of the actual fund. Yeah. And what so you're they, trying so to do, like obviously, is find the, 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 the investment trust with the lowest charges or ongoing charges or com overall charges, Pete, performance fees, etc. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I, all, all I would say is I, I tend to look at the performance of it because you, in a way you don't need to worry about the cost because the costs are already in the performance. So, so really, if you focus on, you know, is the trust in the sector or whatever it is you want exposure to, does it have the right sort of companies that you want to have exposure to? Um, are the, the ongoing charges not ridiculous? Obviously, you don't want mm. to fight, they're, they're having a laugh. But, yeah. you know, if they're in a sensible realm, then, then just don't worry because it's already sort of incorporated in the, the performance that you're seeing in front of you. And you look at historical charts already in there. You know, you don't pay a separate thing that's ongoing charges. Okay, dokie. Okay. All right, cool. Anything else you got there, Pete? Well, I will throw in a quick one, mate, just to, just to lighten the mood. Um, no, no lateral thinking, no No, jokes. mate, this is a lateral thing. I've, I've, last week I, I, I mentioned one which was – I'm running out of these, by the way, people. You'll be glad to hear um, I mentioned one last week where basically um, there's a room and there's glass on the floor, two bodies, two bodies, glass on the floor and water. What's happened? Yeah. I think the and danger is, Pete, if we carry on with these lateral jokes and lateral thinking, the mean you will be on the floor. That would be the thing. Don't, don't be, mate. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll kill me, mate. Be too, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You know, I lost my thought training. But basically, <laughs> Basically, it's it's a goldfish bowl. The goldfish bowl is fine. So the body's a goldfish. Yeah, that's the case. Oh my gosh! Right, I've oh. got another one that's that's quite difficult, and then and then another time I've got an absolute swine fear, which nobody will get. Right. Um, but this one then is quite a quick one. So um, a man gets up, turns the light on, looks out the window, shoots himself. Explain that. So a man gets up. Turns the light on, looks out the window, shoots himself. What's happened? Why has that happened? I, I I don't know. I don't know, Pete. I'll leave that. Leave that for the listeners to absolutely blow their brains over. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. I, I wanted to talk, Pete, about the um, Morrison's. Yeah. Because yeah. Um, the last one of the tweets I did last week was about my portfolio once again uh, being a, a new all time high, but it was propelled by AstraZeneca having a good run and also the takeover bid at Morrison's, Sleepy Morrison's, the retailer. And the reasons why um, Clayton, Dublia, and Rice, CDR, are making a bid for them is not dissimilar to what's gone on at ASDA uh, via another entity trying to. Uh, taking them over over a long um, period of time and that's because Morrison's is one of the uh, I think it's the top four I think it's in top four um, retailer we've got and one of the largest businesses that we've got in the UK regarding employers um, and they manufacture and produce a lot of their their goods got a massive relationship with the UK farmers and other manufacturers um, as well um, but I think this is linked to their property portfolio Pete because they own the vast yeah. majority of their near 500 stores and because CDR have also got a link to a forecourt business slash selling petrol and other stuff to people so I think that's the link there um, the initial offer came in at um, £2.30 and you also get the dividend um, a nearly 30% premium to what the price was prior to that I purchased the stock as a sleepy sort of purchase um, at one pound eighty one and a half, just over that, with yeah. a view that they were doing doing okay, but not loved, and also because I thought there might be a possibility that at some point or other, having had a relationship for a long time now with Amazon, that Amazon might make a bid for them, similar as, as they did in the US yeah. with yeah. Whole Foods. Um, Amazon's still very quiet at the moment. Um, CDR. I've got till the 17th of July, I believe, to come out with a concrete bid. The 230 was um, rejected. There's talk from one of the shareholders at the moment.
that you know w they should open the books and start you know considering a bid of two pounds thirty uh sorry of two of, of, of nearer to two pounds seventy let me get my words right yeah. um and others are saying no nah, they they think they're just trying it on and gonna asset strip it and so on and so forth but personally i i'm i would be happier with a bid north of 270 and nearer to, to three pounds but that's just me probably being biased and hopefully optimistic versus my you know one pound 81 and a half initial buying price last september i'm hoping we'll get a a, a bit of a heads up um middle of july um 17th ish if not before yeah and let's see what um cdr or others because others were b bidding for asda uh, as well and they didn't get it um so will they be interested in morrison's going forward and will the bid come north of um two pounds 30 um the noise yesterday um late on caused the share price of morrison's to rise today um over five percent uh, before closing up four and a half percent at um, two pounds 46 so we'll see we'll see where it goes it's come a long way in a short space of time from sub 180 to two pounds 50 um what date we're looking at here when it was last at um below 180 um 18th of june so less than two weeks ago it was below 180 nobody wanted it and now we're trying to see if whether somebody will bid two pounds 50 or 270 or 290 or whatever for it so that's the developments there. Um, and as, as I think, Pete, there'll be more consolidation going forward. We've been talking about there's going to be more takeovers going forward. And I think still, and we had said this in the last podcast, there's loads of quality value plays in the UK market that are going to see takeovers because there's lots of cheap money around. So if you do your research, there's plenty of opportunities for you to find a stock. You shouldn't always buy a stock purely for takeover speculation because that'll come back and bite you in the bum. Yeah, but yeah. if you're holding a stock and you think it's undervalued and it's had a bid before or you see other stocks being bid for that are in that particular sector, I guarantee you that others, other companies and other entities and private equity companies are also possibly looking at your stock. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens with that particular one. But Morrison's in play at the moment. Let's see if and when it goes and closes north of 250, 260, if another bid comes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, it's funny as we, we talked about it ages ago on the podcast, didn't we? Because I was I was sort of considering buying it and like me, like, like I always do, I, I sort of looked at it and thought about it and didn't do anything. But hey, that's what I, happened. I think a, lot, a lot of people have looked at um, Morrison's Pete. It's a boring, stayed retail stock. It's not going to blow the lights out. And all I was trying to do at the time was try and find a stock which potentially could have a catalyst, but also have some boring stocks, Pete. I could leave that in the portfolio for the next two or three or four years with no bid and generate 5, 10, 50% total returns and yeah. be quite happy with that. Nice, steady. Cause that, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's there in my income side of my portfolio doing nothing. I'm not going to wake up overnight and find, bosh, it's down 30, 40, 50%. Yeah. Unless it's an accounting issue, which could happen to any company, but it's not going to be a profit warning because people have stopped buying food. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. So that's why I bought it. You know, I've got a few stocks here, mate. Go for it, mate. You go for it. Well, a couple of IPOs I'll just mention because they're about and whatever. There's this one called Wise W I S E, which is IPOing soon, I believe, and that used to be Transfer Wise, which does like cross-border payments or something like that yeah you know foreign exchange stuff and whatever but it does it like really cheap you know it's it, it's um so so say for instance you've got foreign nationals who live in the uk and they want to send money back home they use transfer wise or whatever it's going to be called now um they use that that platform that app and they can you know send it back home in their home currency a lot cheaper than the banks do so that's quite a, an interesting thing. And I think they've actually started doing some corporate stuff as well, but I might be wrong on that. But anyway, that IPO is quite soon, but it's an unusual one because it's doing a direct listing, So, it, which I think sort of means it's not – so basically it's going to sort of list on the market. Um, and it's a, I think it's a very small free float. I think it's like, I don't know, 30% or so. A lot is hailed by the family. Um, I did know their name, but I can't remember what it is now. So it's like the the the, the founder and um, his his relations or whatever. They own something like fifty five percent of the company. 
Um, so there's all sorts of things going on there. But it just, I think it's probably going to be quite pricey. You know, the chances are it'll be quite a high, high price. But it's certainly one that looks interesting. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it looks like it's going to be IPOing Pete for um, between six to seven billion dollars. Yeah. Um, and the founders. It's going, be, it's going to be UK, isn't it? So it'll be pounds. Yeah, it's a fintech fintech um play essentially and the, the founders are um oh, i hope i can pronounce this properly and not embarrass myself um let me just get this right pete bear with me mate i'm just trying to get my words around yeah um christo carmen yeah and um travette henrik's kiss something yeah okay okay look those up people uh, but essentially, they're going to have a, a, a dual structure as well, Pete, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, because they, it's like a, a dual class voting structure. So basically, yeah. um, shareholders who are not the founders or whatever will have a different class of shares. So they, so basically, the founders can always keep control. Now, a lot of people don't like that, but you know, in some ways, maybe that's not a bad thing because you often get a really good founder. Who, who is doing great things with the company. And then, of course, other people come in and mess it up. So I think... Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it conf I think it confuses things. So the Class B shares will not will be non-tradable and will not be listed, Pete. Yeah. Um, it just confuses things, I think. And if anything, well, yeah, holds it yeah. if anything holds it back, it might be that. But essentially, Very common. You know, as, as shareholders, if you wanted to purchase it, you end up with the, the Class A shares. You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But very yeah, common interesting in the one. US now, very yeah. common, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's profitable, Pete, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I, it's quite well established. I think it's been around sort of 10 years or something. You know, I don't know. around think... a while. Everyone knows it transfer wise. I'm not sure why they changed it to wise, uh, but, uh, you know, less is more, I suppose. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But another one, one, another one that's come up that I know is this one called CMO Group. And it does online sort of building products, building supplies. And I'd never heard of it, you know, but it's but it's um, purely online. So it's got no shops. Yeah. So it's asset light and whatever. And I do love my, you know, internet-y kind of shopping plays. Um, and if, I think they've got some like seven or nine websites. So it'd be like a like, um, plumbing website and a and a tiles website and a and a garden website and you know they've got these different things um and i was actually surprised i spoke to my contact at james latham lthm and he said oh yeah i know them yeah they're you know and they are a sort of recognized player in the industry and again they've been established sometime like 12 years whatever i think they're growing revenues and i think they're making profit so if the numbers stack up and stuff, you know, it could be an interesting one. CMO group. I think the interesting thing about them, Pete, is that we've been talking about um, DIY and, and the winners that, have, you know, the winners of COVID and all the rest of it. Mm. And I suspect, and I've not looked at the, the, the listings of it, but I suspect they've probably done well during the lockdown, you know. Oh, yeah. And, Stunning. And, like, and the like... sales are probably doing well because, you know, if they're supplying all these builders and DIY enthusiasts, you know, and Kingfisher and and B and Q and etc. and Screwfix have been doing well. Surely they've potentially done well. And like Absolutely. you say, they haven't got the cost of of big behemoth stores. I think they said the sales were up thirty five percent. Wow, that might be. You know, I think the I think the CAGR over like ten twelve years is very good. You know, well, that's, big that's, number. that might be a good call, Pete. I don't, you know, as as you know, I'm not big on buying into IPOs. I tend to like to wait, but that could be a good one. Well, it depends on the price again. You know, if it's sensible. Yeah. Um, another one that I saw, but I don't really know about. Well, there's a couple. There's Bridgepoint. You know Bridgepoint Capital? Private equity company, yeah. Yeah, yeah that one's listing, but I don't really don't know anything about that. Okay. Um, and then another one is Revolution Beauty is listing on AIM. Um, and I think that one is, is, you know, again, just a sort of healthcare, beauty products, online kind of thing. Again, I don't really know much about it, but just there are a couple I've sort of come across that I thought, hmm, they might be more interesting than a lot of the junk you get that lists, you know? Right. And what attracted you to Revelation Beauty, Pete? Was it because it was about makeup? Well, you know, I, mean, I look beautiful. I always need to have me, 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 me beauty stuff, don't I? Me beauty treatments, you know. Uh, no, I, mate, I just, 
what attracted me was it looked like it made money and it looked like it was growing fast. Yeah, I mean, that's look, simplistic. Yeah, that's <laughs> looking like it's going to be valued about 500 mil, Pete, um, which, you know, could be very, very interesting. It sells through a thousand stores across five continents, including Super Drug and Boots in the UK. So that's quite a size that I've, I've not heard of it unless, you know, it, I'd be interested to know well, um, what products and other bits and pieces. I want to know a bit more about them. But yeah, that sounds sounds interesting. I didn't realize it was going to be that sort of size. But yeah, very, very interesting. Well, often I just find these things where I'm reading the RNSs in the morning. Mm. Um, I just, you know, they, they'll put on it, it'll say intention to float, you know, and you just yeah. see these things. A lot of them I sort of open, oh God, that looks a load of junk. So I don't even, doesn't even register in the brain. But but, it, but a couple come up and you think, oh, that might be interesting. I mean, the interesting thing about that one, I'll just pull some notes up here. Mm. Kent based business is a British business, you know. And it's looking to take advantage. If if we get out, if and when we get out of this lockdown, Pete, what are people going to do? The men are going to be grooming, they're making themselves look nice. The ladies are going to be going out, making themselves nice. So the beauty industry is going to be absolutely ripping a new one, aren't they? You know, profitability wise, with people going out wanting to look good and look sharp. Absolutely. Do you know? I saw something before we started this call because normally before we do this call, you know, before we're we're waiting for the time, I have you know the news on or whatever. And there was a thing came on there about, you know, your online shopping and stuff. Yeah. And it was talking about, you know, delivery and all the usual things. But they were talking about how they had, you know, Jason King, who used to be the CEO at Sainsbury's. And he's invested in something, some something I've never heard of, which does like, you know, deliveries of groceries, whatever. And he was saying grocery delivery online delivery is the new convenience thing because people want convenience right convenience has been such a big driver for people and i think younger people you know we're only you know what what we now 32 whatever it is you know people who are younger than us they want they, they do everything online they're digital natives you know they love computers they love laptops they love phones and tablets and all sorts of stuff like that personally i hate the bloody stuff but, you know, they're, they're, they're mad for it. And they don't want to be going into a shop. They want to just go do the do and their thing gets delivered five minutes later. They don't want to wait for anything. I mean, heaven forbid, you don't wait for things. Someone brings you on a scooter, don't they? That's how it works. Yeah. So, so I thought that was interesting because it's like they were talking about groceries now, but I think it applies to everything. I think, I think as the world moves forward, it's almost like, you know, like, like all the, the deliveries and the Amazon deliveries, all the, all the usual ones, they're all fighting for market share because they think it is going to be massive in the future. Yeah. So they're trying to get dominance now. Uh, absolutely. I mean, in, you've, you've prompted me to remind, remind myself of something there as well, Pete, regarding the mm -hmm. grocery business. You will recall the former boss of Tesco's, uh, um, a gentleman by the name of Sir Terry Leahy. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And he bowed out in 2011 after 14 years of char in charge and turned them around. Yeah. It happens to be, right, one of the chief and significant bods aligned to CDR, right? And it's, it's possible that CDR are looking to put Sir Terry Leahy, formerly of Tesco's, at the helm, if not the chairman, of whatever the new Morrisons looks like once they've taken it over. Right, yeah, Morrison's right. having yeah. a new guy leading it, and it happens to be Terry Leahy, who never went away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no, well, it, it's interesting that Justin King never went away from Saint. You know, he he, he left Sainsbury's, but obviously he's doing. A, well, they all do, don't they? And Martin Sorrell never went away. He started. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where it was, they've all got more more to more to do, mate. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course but, they but, have. but with regards to all this IPO and all these takeover business and all the rest of it, Pete. Um, I've got one stock I want to de um, to declare to people, and I put a tweet out about this yep. on 18th of March, and it read: "New holding today. Open to position in a co, whereby I'm effectively buying one pound coins slash sum of parts for 70 pence." After thorough research, I found this code to have global IP, AI, big data, recurring revenues, quality at a reasonable price. Shrewd institutional investors own 29%. Hmm, thinking, catalyst, bean counters, and digital, right? That yep. stock, P is London Stock Exchange, Pete. LSE, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Um, so I've purchased that at um, just over £71.81. And yeah. the reason why I did that was because the stock has been ad been and still continues to be um, absolutely spanked. Because once they mentioned that they were going to make this significant takeover big bid for Refinitiv, and that's what attracted me to it, was a, it's about big data, Pete, going forward yeah. and AI yeah. and everything about all this transactional side of things going forward. Uh, the share price was nearer to £100 per share, Pete, yeah, when I first started looking at this. And I yeah. watched it get sold off and sold off, and everyone's grumbling about the cost of this and how much it may cost, and will they be able to bed it in properly, and you know, will it fit properly and all the rest of it. So the share price went from 99 nearly nearly £100, all the way down, Pete, to sub £70. So yeah. I picked it up in March at um, less than 72 It's sitting at the moment nearer to 80 it's um paying a dividend and it's another one of my slow methodical let's just see if we can get, squeeze out 10 percent per year out yeah. of this stock well, it's, it's, uh, not, it's not going to come out come out overnight and say we've got a profit warning it comes and it drops 40 30 60 percent and i can be boring and just end up enjoying my life and just crack on so that's why i bought that particular stock the thing is mate it's an absolute Bluest of the blue chip kind of asset, isn't it? I mean, one billion pound market cap, Pete. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's but it's like you think about it. The London Stock Exchange is such an important part of our economic system, our financial system. Our, you know, it's it's just so important. So you know, that's not the kind of thing that's suddenly going to be usurped. I mean, maybe in forty years' time. There'll be some disruptor comes along where you won't need it, maybe, whatever. But I just would be amazed if, if that was usurped in the, in the next 10, 20 years. It's just not That's gonna... what I'm hoping. I'm hoping with what they've done with Refinitiv here, they're showing that they're not falling asleep at the wheel. They're mm. engaging in AI. They're engaging in big data. And they're looking at how quicker can we do all, the, all these, these, these transactions that we're doing. You know, yeah. And we're not going to, you know, we, we're leaving... You know, obviously, when they started talking about this this deal, they weren't they didn't think about all the different aspects of what was got, what we're currently in now. But you know, there it's about being proactive, Pete, and adapting. And if you've got a fully integrated financial exchange, you're going to have to st keep stay on your toes because you've got all these different free apps and this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth. So you're going to have to innovate, Pete. Yeah, yeah. Very true. So, Very so that's true. the one I wanted to share with you guys. I've still got a few more left, and then that's me done, hopefully. Mate, can I just mention GSK quickly? Go for it. Um, I, know, I am aware that time's running on. Um, yeah, GSK, Glaxo, Smithline. Um, they came out last week or whatever with an announcement about their strategy going forward. I've had a really good look at it, and I did it, you know, because I hold GSK. I did it over the last couple of days and whatever. And. Um, you know, it's sort of, I think the market was a bit, initially the, the, the shares sort of went up during the day and then they fell back. And I think the market's been a bit sort of cold on it. But me personally, I think I think it looks like a pretty good thing to do. I mean, they're splitting out, as we know, in 2022, they're splitting out the GSK healthcare business. That's going to have a fair bit of debt, but I don't think it's a problem. It's about four, the debt will be four times the EBITDA. Now, for something that's got very reliable repeat revenues, I mean, you'd be amazed. When I use this skin cream. So I have like a sort of like <laughs> eczema, lovely, yeah? I got eczema on my arm or whatever it is. I get like dry, dry skin on my arm, yeah? And I've got this stuff called Umivate, and it's made by GSK. You know, and you, you, you've got all these things in your life that you use that are made by GSK. And those kind of things are just, you know, I, I, I must have had billions of tubes of that over the last 10 years, whatever. And over the next 10 years, I'm going to have it because, you know, I need to have it. And, and they've got so many products that just repeat things like that. So I think that bit can handle the, the, the high amount of debt. I mean, it's, I think it's fine. Um, the other one that, that so they're creating then the um, new GSK, which will basically be vaccines and specialty medicines. Now, I just see parallels with AstraZeneca. I think they are trying to copy what AstraZeneca has done because AstraZeneca done a brilliant job after that 
potential takeover all them was it Pfizer all them years ago I can't remember it was so long ago yeah, they, got, they, didn't, they didn't succumb to Pfizer's bid yeah yeah that's right and they and they fought off Pfizer um with with the you know the thing saying we've got all this oncology pipe, pipeline and whatever else we've got and and it's exact and, and it's work AstraZeneca were absolutely right and I think Glaxo are going to do the same thing and what's happened is for years the market has been expecting the dividend to be cut on GSK. I think it's like 80 pence for the whole entity at the moment. And it's been 80 pence for years. And it sort of looked like it wasn't particularly sustainable. Well, they've used this strategic change to reset that um, dividend. And it's now down to 55p. But it's going to be 45p for the new GSK. And it's going to be 10p for the the um, GSK consumer bit gets spun out, yeah? The healthcare bit gets spun out. Um, but they do intend to adopt a progressive dividend policy so that the, the dividend should increase every year from that lower base. And I think there's every chance they can do that. I mean, they've got very, they've got, you know, targets of what they think they can achieve by 2026. And they've even, you know, give us an indication of what they think they can do by 2030. And, you know, OK, they might not achieve it, but I think the chances are they probably can. Oh, you are you are such a frustrating guy, Pete. You really what do you think? What do you think? <laughs> no, um, I, I know what I you know. what. Well, you don't know what I think. Um, it is one of my stocks to declare at a future date. And no. you've done it again. No. Because I am going up the food chain and no. I've always, always said I'm not going to buy GSK because I have AstraZeneca. Yeah, um, but it is one I purchased, um, and it's in my portfolio. Um, yeah. I purchased it in February. Really, I wasn't going to. I wasn't going to reveal it, but I feel on a bound. To, if you, you might as well mention it now, it, mate. To, yeah. to 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 declare my hand and not just go mm, and say nothing and then reveal it another day and people go, well, Pete was talking about it that time and he never said anything. Yeah, no, you, you should say. Wheelie, you're a bloody idiot buying that. No, no, no. Ah. I, um, I'm in agreement with you. My my sum of the parts is over eighteen pounds for for both both sides of the business. And the strategic thing they've said of late is because I think they've been triggered and forced it. They've been talking about it and talking about not really doing it. And now they've come come out categorically and saying they're going to do it. Some people have then sold it off a little bit because they think they're grumbling because the dividend's been reduced a bit. But value in my eyes will be released over the next two to three years. Uh, as a consequence of of this of this split, so yeah. I, I've got some of parts of, of north of eighteen pounds. Um, it's currently sitting at what fourteen. I've not looked at it today. Fourteen thirty six. Fourteen thirty six. So yeah. yeah, it's it's there, and it's going to be a slow burn. People don't want slow burns, Pete. They want up thirty, down forty, up thirty, and they <laughs> want to gamble. I, I'm I'm quite happy to just churn out five ten percent. You know, I do have the the smaller entities that I take risks on, and I, and I take big risks on. And they'll generate 100% and 200% and 300%. But that's because it's a smaller percentage of my portfolio. But it helps my overall portfolio. And I take bigger positions in the likes of Glasgow Welcome, um, AstraZeneca, L uh, London Stock Exchange, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? I won't take those size of positions in a really speculative or high-risk stock. Yeah, and you'd, you'd be crazy too. I mean, yeah, people do, but yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe I should want to cover, mate? No, that's it, mate. I think we just need to say... Thank you to every one of our listeners, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you ever so much for those new subscribers to our uh, Amazon, YouTube, Spotify, Google, SoundCloud, Audioboom um, accounts. The numbers are, are rising. I want to thank you all so much for subscribing to that. And thank you also for the, for the individuals that keep coming out and i think it's like a race sometimes to see who yeah. can give us a feedback the fir first on a friday uh, once the podcast is live and we, we love that we just we're just pleased to see that you ladies and gents wherever you are are still keen on this podcast and we keep trying to innovate we keep trying to make it better for you guys we keep listening to what you've got to say you know lawrence mentioned about the equalization of the of the sound and audio quality and we've improved that but we know there's still room for it to improve and for those that are running and on bikes and, you know, listening to it, sometimes it's difficult. So we're going to try our very best to improve that for you all. And just please keep giving it your feedback, the good feedback, the bad feedback, because that's the only way that Pete and I can learn to and ensure that this podcast is better for everybody. 
So we just want to thank you all for your continued support. Thank you. And uh, i got to go. So see you next time. All right, everyone. Take care. God bless. Stay lucky. And above all, look after each other and do what you can for each other. And make sure that you also look after yourself. Self-care is important as well as caring for others. God bless. Bye-bye for now. Cheers. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast was brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. 